Awesome. Welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us yet again to one of my I have been wondering series and today I have been wondering is with the queen of Canlet with Larissa Lai who has been an idol and, and an amazing human I met her oh my god I met her in Toronto in 2017 I want to say or 18 and then I had to facilitate a, a panel that she was on. And by the end of the panel, I was like, I'm not worthy. This is, she is just too amazing. I'm just not worthy of this. Stop it. All right. So I'm not going to stop it. This is, this is my hour. I get to say this. Uh, <laughs> I am going to say uh, that uh, you are now with uh, I Have Been Wondering, which is my monthly series. Uh, where I invite authors who are marginalized, whether um, marginalized through being of uh, racial minority or uh, queer, trans, or two-spirit, or whatever intersection between uh, those identities. Uh, this is a space for us to be who we want to be and talk about what we want to talk about and just have some, um, for today, some queer people of color talking about writing. And my guest for today is Deleur Salai. But before I move any further, I am going to acknowledge the lands that I am on. I am coming to you today from the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh lands, um, which is the Coast Salish people's lands. I am uh, quite honored to always name those lands because specifically as somebody who came to Canada as an immigrant, arrived here six, seven years ago, and was welcomed and, and, and supported by a lot of the indigenous folks on this land who uh, appreciated my art, showed me love, showed me support is uh, quite meaningful to me, specifically when I am an uninvited guest on this land. So uh, I truly appreciate the beauty of this land and the beauty of its people. And tonight, and I have been wondering, I have Larissa Lai. Hi, Larissa. Hey, Danny. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I am excited to have you today, my friend. Uh, Larissa Lai is a poet, critic, and novelist. She has written seven books, uh, Sybil Unrest. Sybil Unrest, did I say it correctly? Awesome. Sybil Unrest with Rita Wong. Um, Ottoman, Otto, oh my, I'm sorry. Can you help me with this one? Oh good, Automaton. Automaton, it's hard for me, God. Automaton Biographies, Iron Goddess of mer uh, mer Mercy, Slanting Eye Imagining We, When Fox is a Thousand, Saltfish Girl, and of course, The Tiger Flu. Involved in cultural organizing, experimental poetry, and spe speculative fiction communities since the, 19, the late 1980s, she has received the Jim Duggan's Mid-Career Novelist Prize, the Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Fiction, the Astria Foundation Emerging Writers Award, and twice the otherwise honor book. She holds a Canada Research Chair at the University of Calgary, where she directs the Insurgent Architects House for Creative Writing. Thank you again so much for coming today, Larissa. I'm really honored. Thanks so much for having me, Danny. It's such an honor and pleasure to be here and to be invited by you. I'm really, I'm really thrilled. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. All right. So I have been wondering, Lois Salai, and I have been wondering about the balance between love and rage. We live currently in a world that demands we remain resilient, that we engage with everyone around us with love and understanding. During the pandemic, we were asked to remain calm in a time that offers us nothing but. However, that's not new to us marginalized folks. We have always been asked to represent ourselves, our art, our communities with love rather than rage. Love becomes this sickly feeling, too sweet to handle, that we have to sugarcoat all we are with. So, where do you stand as an author in the spectrum between love and rage? How do you open yourself up to being rightfully rageful? Or do you build a boundary with rage when it comes to your writing? Thank you, Danny. It's such, it's such a great question. And before I start to answer, I'd just like to um, acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Treaty 7 territories. So these are the lands of um, 
the Blackfoot, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda? It's such a fantastic question. Um, and this is something I think about a lot, this tension between love and rage. I think, you know, for me, there it's not a binary, so it's not on a it's not on a scale, but rather, you know, I'm just discovering, I think in the pandemic, how much rage I actually have. And I think it's a lot, like a lot of fright, like so much that it frightens me. Mm. But I think a big part of the reason why I feel rageful when I feel rageful is because I love, you know, our communities have been through so much and they've given so much. Um, and I think, but I think also for me, love is sort of weirdly tied up with, with gratitude. So that's mm. not weird, I guess. I mean, it should be tied with gratitude. Um, gratitude for, you know, the queer, Asian and BIPOC communities that have accepted me for the Black and, and Indigenous communities that have made space for me in the midst of their own struggles. And for more difficult formations as well, like the university and the state where, you know, I'm grateful and I love. Um, it's in spite of a lot of things. And mm -hmm. yet, you know, I have a place to teach. I have a place to share ideas. Um, we live in a more or less functioning democracy with some measure of rights. I get that these things are totally fraught. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me also the rage, you know, the rage may well come in part from the fraughtness, right? It's like, we have these things, they're good things, but they're not perfect. Mm -hmm. And um, and when they're not perfect, they're really they're really deeply imperfect, and the imperfection um, has deep roots that it's that are really hard for us to extricate ourselves from, and so it's mm -hmm. infuriating. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sexism, racism, homophobia still exist. Democracy and human rights can't quite seem to let go of Eurocentrism. Universities mm -hmm. still remain these largely white supremacist places. Um, and their administrative forms are still, you know, um, they leave a lot to be desired, right? They're still, the practices are still so oppressive in spite of people's best intentions often. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, a lot of times, you know, the rage comes from that contradiction. Um, it's enraging to sort of live in a world where everything's so entangled, the good with the bad. Um, and it's enraging that it's so difficult, if not impossible, to extricate ourselves from the horrors of history. And so, you know, you're talking about the pandemic in your question. Um, I sort of feel like if the pandemic's not a lesson in entanglement, I, I'm, I really am not sure what is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was funny, I was thinking about your question and because um, when we had first, um, started talking about, you know, what kinds of things we might talk about in our session mm. today. And he said, oh, what about kindness? And I, and I thought, oh, kindness, you know, it's such an important force in our world. And I'm also kind of conscious because of the way, I don't know, something about my nature, the way I present to people, people imagine me to be a kind person. I'm not really sure that I am. Mm. And um, as I was thinking about these things, I kind of, I came up with an image of myself, you know, I think of myself as somebody, I'm standing in a field, I'm surrounded by beings, some human, some non-human. Mm -hmm. Everyone is suffering, though obviously some are carrying more than others. I know that it's the collective that matters, but my hands are dripping with blood. Mm. Um, from violence, some committed by me, some committed in my name, some I inherit. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, there's someone with a machete at my heels trying to cut my feet out from under me. <laughs> oh my <laughs> I God. This, uh, I do have this ruptured Achilles tendon, so I think a lot about feet, you know, and grounding. Mm -hmm. And then with my bloody hands, I'm trying to fix all the things that have been broken. Well, most of the people around me, especially the ones with any power, are busy washing their hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if that's kindness trying to fix for me. I feel, I guess I do feel a rather massive sense of responsibility. Mm. And maybe that comes across to people sometimes as kindness, but it's actually, it's something a little bit different. It's like, I, you know, and it's connected to love, right? It's like, I love this mm -hmm. world. It's so messed up. I need to fix it. 
my hands aren't clean and also here I am with my hands you know like yeah. trying to get them into the cogs and change things and of course everything's all entangled and the wheels are turning yeah so those are my initial thoughts on rage yeah. and love <laughs> I mean to be honest a um that that image that you threw um with with the machete and the blood and the washing of the hands um no wonder you create full on full blown words so beautifully because it is so engulfing as a, as an image like it told us a lot in such such a short image um so yes, when, when I approached you and I told you about your, your uh, topic, I suggested kindness because I do see you as a kind, having a kind um, strength, I would say, but I don't know if I would connect that kindness with softness. I don't mm -hmm. think that is the point that I wanted to come across because mm -hmm. I don't think of kindness as soft. Sometimes somebody who is, who's very powerful, very capable, would bring acts of kindness that might not feel as such, if mm. that makes sense. Mm. And I think that that's something that we as, I think, I think of you saying the word gratitude. And for me, it is such a tainted word mm -hmm. because as, as, a, as a newcomer, as somebody who came here to Canada, I faced a lot of calls for me to shut the hell up because mm -hmm. otherwise I'm not grateful mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. being on this side of the world, to being quote unquote saved. Um, it is as if there's this white savior complex that people around me just wanted to live through and me speaking up takes away from that white savior. And so it, it, it made it even harder for me to just tell the stories that I want to tell. If that makes right. sense. Right. And yeah, so yeah. I, I, I'm, yeah, I, there is tension, I would say, between gratitude, between love, and between kindness, and between rage. All of those words are living in the same quantum, I, I think, mm -hmm. and they're all pulling at each other. I think I think they really, really are, you know, Danny, and I'm very kind of conscious of that, that usage of gratitude, I feel that often put upon me as well. Mm. Um, I'm an, also, also an immigrant to this country a, a little bit, been here a little bit longer, but still an immigrant and my parents also. Mm. And um, so that pressure to be grateful, you know, which is so infuriating. And it, but I think for me that, you know, what I do with gratitude, because for me, it's also important to be grateful because if one is not grateful for the extraordinary things one has, then, well, first of all, it breeds discontent and discontent can be very disempowering. Mm -hmm. And then also, I don't know, I feel for me that it's important to be grateful as a measure, as a way of recognizing the, the, pri the privileges that I have. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of oppression as well, like don't get me wrong, but it's both things. And um, so, yeah, I think one needs to make a distinction between the, the kinds of expectations that, um, that the white world wants to put on us mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. things we actually feel in and for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, because, because otherwise our own feeling life, right, is constricted um, either in reaction to mm -hmm. the things that are expected of us or in, um, or, you know, to obey the things that are expected of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At some point, right, one needs to, I don't know, just like not have to worry about it. I mean, for me, that's where the pot, where, you aren't free as long as you're kind of looking over your shoulder, you know, they want me to be grateful. I'm not going to be just despite them. Well, then they're still like there in your face, aren't they? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Jane Chai says there's such a difference between being threatened or forced to be grateful and being grateful just freely. And I think that that's meaningful as well. I'm sorry, Jane, if I'm saying your name incorrectly. Um, yeah, but the point that that is coming across is um, I had a panel question being like, oh, aren't you grateful being here in Canada? And like, I was on a panel with like, like talking about my book and like how, like I, I have. Just rude. 
That's just it's rude. just rude. And like, mm -hmm. and, and my answer came across as cocky. I, I said, yeah, I'm grateful for myself. I went through a difficult experience and I had to leave everything that I know. And then I had to come to this new brave world that I'm living in. And I managed to publish a book and I managed to get my name out there. So I am very grateful for myself. And, and, <laughs> and I'm, I am, I am, um, yeah, yeah. I think that that's a really, <clears throat> that is a perfect answer because that kind of, I think of that, that's a really aggressive question actually that that audience member asked you, right? Mm -hmm. And that is actually addressing whatever feelings of gratitude you might have, you know, on your own behalf, except for the ones that you express. It's like, yeah, I'm grateful for, holy crap, you've been through so much. Like, and for mm -hmm. this person to just sort of think of themselves, you know, as the one bestowing upon you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so, they wouldn't say that to a white Canadian writer who's been here for three generations or even one who's been here for one generation or half a 100%, generation. 100%, right? 100%. And I agree with that. Like, that's the thing. Go it's ahead, please. Sorry, sorry. So I'm just saying it was a racist question that you got up. I would, I would say that's the thing. Like, there is this, this, this weird dance that we have to do as marginalized writers to... Uh, dance around the feelings of the white audience sitting there being like uh, yeah I'm so thankful that you have decided to not go to the white bread writer out there and come to my brown uh, show <laughs> like it is it, it just somehow I don't know like they, they want us to show that gratitude so they will feel good about themselves that they are there and i'm like no 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 i'm i am an artist just like the next person just like the next person and i'm actually sharing my art with you and it's goddamn good art so you need to appreciate and actually you should be grateful for me thank you yes yeah exactly there's this whole kind of um culture of assumption around hospitality right and who mm -hmm. is giving, who is giving gifts to whom mm -hmm how we got what they got in order to be able to give it. Mm. And I Candace says, Candace says, grateful, great gratitude can be so personal and complicated. Mm. She, they agree with you that the question was rude and aggressive. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I think there's something really wonderful about moments like this, right? Mm -hmm. When it's, when it's a BIPOC, um, gay writer who's doing the hosting and then we don't I do feel grateful to you for hosting yeah. me of course I do because you give me a gift and it comes from a place of you know of generosity across a reach of cultural difference and there's not a colonial relationship between us mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that and to be honest I was, I, I told you before we started uh, going live, I was texting with uh, a dear friend of mine who lives in Spain and I was like, that Larissa Lai said yes to coming to my show. And that is, it just, it's meaningful to me that I, I showed up to this country literally seven, seven years ago. And now I can pick up the phone and be like, hey, Michael V. Smith, hey, Larissa Lai, hey, Farzana Doctor, do you want to? Uh, come in on a random show and be like a part of this this uh, experiment of mine and people would be like yeah sure yeah so I, I am I am really uh, yeah. okay all right let's move on let's move on to writing <laughs> yes you so many gifts to us which is why you know you're very you are hospitable you're gen genuinely generous um, with your you know with your time with your thoughts with your ideas with with your kindness with your own beautiful work um, of course we would say yes it's not like you're coming I was going to say, it's not like you're coming with nothing. Even if you had you come with nothing, no one ever comes with nothing. So, mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. But you are bringing us these, these specific beautiful things and um, they must be, they must be acknowledged. Of course they must be acknowledged. Well, you're bringing me tears. That's what you're bringing me. So <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm taking from that is that I want to hear you read, please. And thank you. You promised me some reading and it's a good time for that. So you are the star. 
of this the next 10 20 minutes whatever time that you want go ahead and i'm going to mute myself i leave you folks with larissa lai thank you danny i'm very honored to read i'm going to read about 10 for about 10 minutes um from the very opening of um of the tiger flu which is a speculative fiction novel came out two years ago um so what's the first chapter it's called the fourth wave um, and what do you need to know? It's the near future, the world is falling apart. The speaker is a young girl called Cora Ko, who is living with her family, um, who are all sick with the flu uh, in the crumbling Woodwards building um, on lands that were once called Vancouver, but they're known as um, Saltwater City in this novel. Behind the clouds of the new monsoon, the ancient mainframe Chang rolls too fast across the sky. He's a big guy, but he appears much bigger than he should because his orbit is deteriorating. His period is down to two hours now, and he casts a veiled shadow over the rooftop of the old Woodward's building, engulfing Uncle Wise's carefully cultivated garden. Cora leans against the fence that holds old Delphine in her pen, stares mournfully into Delphine's golden eyes. Uncle Wise got it, she tells the goat. The tendril information scales Cora's got plugged into the single band halo that circles her head waved gently. For all Chang is so close, the people of Saltwater Flats don't have access to him anymore. Only the citizens of the glass towers in Saltwater City can tap in. As soon as she can afford it, she'll add rings to her halo or even a full helmet so she can get wiser quicker. She needs all the help she can get. Ma, says old Delphine. K2's also sick. Ma. Uncle Y says that so was Big Brother Everest, though I've never met him. If he comes back to us, he could save us, but I don't think he's coming back. Ma. And Charlotte's got it. Cora never calls Charlotte mom. It seems too corny. Women aren't immune, you know, Delphine. If they're hungry enough, if they're depleted enough, women can get it. If Charlotte's got it, that means I'm the only one left in our family who doesn't have the tiger flu. Meh, don't be like that. Cora knows Delphine cannot actually understand her grief and dread, but still the tendril scales atop Cora's head droop. She scratches the old goat between the eyes. Delphine's hair is pleasantly coarse and her forehead is warm. Soon it will be you and me against the world. Behind Cora, the jars in which Uncle Y grows potatoes lean against crumbling retainer walls. The jars are huge, each one big enough to hold Cora, her goat, and a couple of tigers too. 40 floors below those walls in the streets of saltwater flats, women, young and old, healthy and ill, happy and sad, go about their daily business shop for a bit of chicken for supper, a few vegetables, a bicycle, a second-hand cake mixer. A wealthy few rest in quiet cafes, sip tea, eat steamed buns. Others stand on street corners arguing. There are no men in the streets. The men are shut up in houses, covered in lesions and coughing their lungs out, the nasty and condescending beside the gentle and well-intentioned or else they are already dead, except for the tiger men, a small contingent of male survivors who have the flu in all its contagion, but whose symptoms never proceed beyond a modest, beyond a modest cough and the occasional lesion. Miraculously, they thrive in the privacy of the Pacific Pearl Parkade, doors closed to the world. Although the tiger flu has a taste for men, it doesn't discriminate against the wealthy. In fact, the first to succumb to the fourth wave was the hated despot Aloysius Chow McPherson. 
the citizens of Saltwater City rejoiced, as did the denizens of the surrounding quarantine ring known as Saltwater Flats. Then Chow McPherson's kindly brother, Ferdinand, took ill. The people still rejoiced because, though kind, Ferdinand was a high-ranking member of a despotic family. The family company, Post Light Industries, ruled the city in its own best interests. Chow McPherson's wife, Sophia, took charge, but she too got sick. Then his daughter, Isabel, took over. As Cora is all her family's got, Isabel is all the city has got. She better be enough. Far behind Chang, the backup mainframe Eng rolls in her expanding orbit. If Isabel could open diplomatic channels with the Cosmopolitan Earth Council, which controls the last remaining rockets outside the United Middle Kingdom, perhaps they could be convinced to help right the orbits of Chang and Eng. Otherwise, Eng's elliptical orbit will only deepen and hundreds of years will pass between sightings. Delphine lies down in her bed of straw. See you tomorrow, sweet goat. Cora places her hands on the highest rung of the fence, hikes herself up so she can lean in and plant a kiss on the goat's rough forehead. Something rustles behind the shed. She drops her feet back to the ground. Who's there? Oh, I forgot to mention before starting that, um, so I apologize for this and I kind of don't, there's a lot of cursing uh, in this opening section of the novel. And the reason for it is um, as the novel progresses, there's a mother religion that's on the rise. And um, as it rises, the nature of the curses shifts. And so I wanted to start the novel with a sort of a sense of, you know, the kinds of swear words that people use. So sorry if folks are offended, um, it's coming anyway. Uh, some, something rustles behind the shed. She drops her feet back to the ground. Who's there? No answer. She goes to look, but before she's taken half a step, a young man leaps out and grabs her from behind. Boo! Mother fuck, get off me. Who the hell are you? Actually, she recognizes him. He's a friend of her brother's, Stash Sats. He looks awful. His face is covered in weeping sores. His eyes ooze pus. What happened to you? How did you get up here? K2 gave me the keys. We lost our jobs this week because we're too sick to lift the elk at the abattoir. That's awful. He grips her tighter, nibbles her ear. Please let go. He doesn't. I mean it. You don't want me to hug you anymore? Stash, I would rather hug a grist sister. Let go, really. Dirty Coraco, says the boy. There's no such thing as grist sisters. They're just a story told by scared old men. The bear, the bear hug from behind turns aggressive. Let go of me. Her scales writhe. When I wasn't sick, you liked me just fine. I did not. I hardly know you. The last healthy member of the Co family. He leans in licks her face with his white tongue. Ugh, what are you trying to do? He bites her cheek hard enough to break skin. Trying to give me your disease? He's fierce, but he's thin, even thinner than Cora. She might be hungry, but she's tough as an old shoe, or he's pale and wasted. She kicks a foot out from under him. Little whore, what did you do that for? He pulls her to the ground with him, rubs his face into hers, tries to stick his tongue in her mouth. Get off me, rolls him over. Gripped by jealousy and desire, he won't let go. On the battered concrete floor that once kept water out of the apartments below, they roll over one another, closer and closer to Uncle Y's potato jars and the crumbling wall. They'll go over the edge if they aren't careful. Cora, throws her weight in the opposite direction towards Delphine's pen. She's heavier than Stash, back they roll. Her weight on him makes his heart pump. She finds fresh strength. Towards the wall, they turn again. You little shit, I'm gonna beat the fuck out of you. Cora won't be defeated. She jams her shoulder hard against his and forces their momentum back Delphine's way. 
Rage grips him, makes him superhuman for a moment. They spiral furiously into a jar. It tips over and hits the wall. Fragments of loose concrete clatter to the ground 40 floors below. The wall gives. The jar crashes overboard and smashes onto the sidewalk. I'm not gonna die just cause you are. She forces him back and they roll all the way to Delphine's fence. The old goat bleats panic. It isn't fair. He pushes on top of her again, rolls her towards the brink as she attempts to pull her arm free to punch him. Here's the edge. There's no wall to protect them. Holy shit, holy shit, they're going to fall. Over the ledge they go. Cora grabs a coil of loose rebar. The sick boy clings to her waist. I don't want to die. She could kick him in the belly and he would plummet. She feels the temptation. Her arm begins to quiver. She can't hold their weight much longer. She has to decide now. She hoists them both back up to the safety of the rooftop garden. You little fuck, she hisses. The monsoon clouds burst open and shower and shower and shower them. Ah, there's a typo there. The monsoon clouds <laughs> burst open and showers them. Stash trembles flat on his belly beside her, gets a hold of himself and gives her a crooked grin, half malevolent, half teasing. Piss off, Cora says. I don't care if you are my brother's friend. You're not welcome in my house. Oh, sorry. oh my God. <laughs> no. Passage and it's like, hey, subject verb agreement. What's going on? <laughs> That was fucking awesome. Oh my god. There's a typo there. It's a typo. How dare we have a typo? Does it happen to you though when you're reading like when you're reading new material? Yeah. And you're reading it and you're like, oh, that's not a full sentence. Oh, I gotta fix that. And this book, I've been over it so many times. I thought it was perfectly clean. And so that was yeah. the, the system's like, oh my god. <laughs> I love how you like calmly stopped in the middle being like I am going to swear now and then you proceeded to swear which is awesome like this is have you seen the show Michael B. Smith and I talked about fisting so <laughs> it's not like <laughs> so um but anyway I want to give space now for everybody to say yes to Larissa, that was such a good reading. Uh, oh God, like you could have cut the tension with a freaking uh, knife. Uh, I was, oh God, I was like sitting and I'm re I read the book, I know what happened. <laughs> and I was sitting there being like on the edge of my seat. Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for that reading. Well, now that you got us right into the tiger flu, I want to talk to you about word building. So I remember back in 2018 when I met you at uh, Glad Day. Was it 2018 or 2017? I, I can't recall. I think it was 2018. And it wasn't yeah. Glad Day. It was for that beautiful festival. Yeah, it was. It was at Naked Heart. Yeah. Naked Heart. That's right. Yeah. So I, I was there for your book lunch for when you launched the tiger flu. And then... <laughs> Uh, somebody asked you about the word building and that question, that answer just stayed with me. So basically what I'm doing now is getting the same answer from you again. Oh. So I, I saw how much work you put into word building in the Tiger Flu, how much work you have placed into uh, time and seasons and name of cities and um, planets around and stuff. It was a whole thing. And I want to ask you about your techniques that you use um, to tell us about the word that you invite your reader into. How do you navigate that complex setting while also presenting it ever so smoothly to the reader? Thank you, Danny. It's a good question. And I haven't got a clue what I said at Naked Heart. So this may be a completely different answer. Um, I certainly do think about it a lot. It was a real challenge for this, for this novel in particular. And I feel like I learned so much about world, world building by writing this novel. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the simple conclusion that I've come to, and it, I did learn this by actually by in this particular project, is that 
um, is that plot and setting are the same thing. So plot equals mm -hmm. setting. Um, I have a little workshop that I sometimes teach. It's more recent though. So I wasn't teaching this yet when we met. Mm -hmm. Glad day. Um, but uh, this workshop, I call it Chekhov's Galaxy. And it's essentially, it takes the principle of Chekhov's gun. I take the principle of Chekhov's gun and I show how it applies to the entire world of, of the novel. Um, so you remember, you guys remember what Chekhov said, right? One must never place a loaded gun on the stage if it isn't gonna go off. It's because it's wrong to make promises you don't mean to keep. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that in all fiction, but especially speculative fiction, the whole world of the novel is in fact a promise. And the story, the novel story is the unfolding of that world. Um, so the basic principle then is that setting should already convey the story that's gonna unfold, or to put it differently, don't put anything in the setting that's not gonna have some narrative mm -hmm. significance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, this is obviously a really, really rigid rule. And at the end of that workshop, I come to the conclusion that one must not follow it as a dictum because you, the, everything could just get too crunchy. Um, you get it, but you get a very pure line if you mm -hmm. stick to this dictum. Um, and obviously nobody wants to be that pure, there'd be no life in the novel, but it's mm -hmm. still a really useful principle to sort of think about, you know, um, what it is you're putting in the novel and why and where it's going to go and what it's going to do narratively. And really that is, that is the, that is the only point. Um, that is, but that is the lesson that I learned. And I learned it, of course, by writing this world that was like, that was massive, mm -hmm. right? This novel at its most horrible was 500 some, 500, more than 500 pages long. It was just mm -hmm. huge. And it was mm -hmm. killing me because I was fascinated by the world. Like I was like, I had this idea for a world and as I began to write it, I wrote, mm -hmm. it and wrote it and wrote it and became more and more fascinating to me and probably only to me <laughs> because it was getting hairier and hairier. This novel took a long time to write. So with each passing year, right? Hairier and hairier to the point where it was just, it was just unmanageable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, thought, I feel that sometimes, like I, I just finished uh, another round with the Foghorn Echoes with my next novel and it's not speculative fiction in any way. I am talking about like have the novels set in Syria, um, but at the same time, I am taking the same advice to my word building uh, as I'm presenting the, 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 the characters and their relationship to an actual land that is Syria. And I think Janie Chang was the one who told me this a couple of uh, months ago. And I have been wondering is when you look at your own past you are writing historical fiction. So it is um, it is interesting. I have a question from uh, Katniss, if I'm saying your name incorrectly, I am sorry, my friend. Uh, Larissa, I'm curious how much time you spend plotting word building before you write your first full draft or if the two processes are um, enmeshed for you. That's a really good question, Cadence Mandibura. That's a really great question, Cadence. Um, how much time do I spend world building before I write the first draft or are they enmeshed? They are meshed. I mean, I do them simultaneously, but often in separate documents. Mm. Um, and especially, if it, that was especially the case with the tiger flu where I was like, okay, this is what the world is like. And these are the, there were actually three protagonists at the start, I had to kill one. Um, <laughs> um, kill your darlings, they say, right? So there's two. Yeah. two. And um, so I had some idea, you know, of who they were, of what their arc was going to be. And I would start to write it thinking that I understood the world as I began to write, invariably, both characters, both the characters and the world presented surprises, right? You guys must have mm -hmm. this experience when you're writing. You're writing, you think, I know how it's gonna be. I know what's gonna happen. I know what this world is like. And then you go in there and you, you have your, you know, your pen on the paper or your fingers on the keyboard and you're writing something completely different. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Because the writing mm -hmm. itself is a, a kind of process of discovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you try to fight that, 
you kill your novel, you kill the, the energy of the story and um, you kill your characters and you kill your settings. So you can't force your original vision onto the page um, or you will not get a novel. So you yeah. have to let that sort of, you know, that, that wild force. That's why when you hear writers talking about themselves as vessels for somebody speaking, you know, behind them, I think that's why people sometimes talk about the experience like that. It does feel that way. It's like, where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? And of course, as it comes, speaking of gifts, we were talking about gifts earlier. Um, whatever comes, the more unexpected, I feel, the more unexpected it is, the greater the gift it is. And it must be respected as such. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the two are absolutely enmeshed. But the, by the same token, you still have to get something concrete onto the page. So I'll do that. I'll write, you know, I'll have the story and then either at the bottom of the page, but actually it's another separate file. I'll be like, mm -hmm. oh, actually, you know, there has to be a crossroads, you know, here, or there has to be a market over there, or there has to be a planet in the sky that you didn't realize was there. And I'll make mm -hmm. notes of that if I can see them coming. Mm -hmm. um, and then invariably it's about the rewrite, right? Mm -hmm. You end up re rewriting because you find there are invariably contradictions in the way that you initially imagined the world and what it grows into as you're writing. 100%, like when, when I wrote the, the latest novel that I wrote, I didn't realize until I reached the very end of my first draft that I killed all of my characters, that oh, everybody no. died. Oh, so no. I, I literally didn't realize that like my solution to every problem was kill them all. <laughs> and I had to go back and be like, no, that makes no sense. <laughs> and yeah, so I changed that quite a lot. Um, there's a lot of questions that are coming, but there's a question that we agreed on you and I, and I would love, love to ask it. And then I'll sure. go back to your questions, folks. Um, the question is still on word building, however, from a different perspective. So in the Tiger Flu, you represented gender identities, sexualities, as, as well as racial tensions. However, you also presented them in such an intriguing, um, integrated, I would say, even integrated way. So how do you, as a marginalized author, choose the way you represent an identity on the page? When do you decide, did, when do you decide, when do you decide to speak up for your uh, character? And when do you hold back and let the character navigate the word through their own identities? Right, right. I love this question and I love the way you've asked it too. So I have a few things to say to that, Danny. Um, you know, the first is I had a, an experience very early, very, very early on. I remember Dionne Brand before she was as well known as she is now. Um, mm -hmm. but she's still very much like a strong figure in the community, um, Toronto based. And I remember her coming to Vancouver. Um, I must have been in my early 20s. And uh, having this, rec have this recollection of her, of being invited to an event where they had invited um, just those participants in the event who were young, very young women of color, mm -hmm. um, to sort of have a little bit of private time with her before the, you know, the crowds came. Mm -hmm. And she said to me at that time, I'll never forget this, she said, you know, Larissa, I think like we're finally at a moment in history where we have the chance to write our lives um, with ourselves at the center in the fullest way that we know how, and we have mm -hmm. to take it. And so I really, I took that advice so much to heart that it's really important, I um, mean, the first instance to write with ourselves at the center, which means sure, it's still doing the work of representation, but I think the way that she said it was, it's not just about doing the work of representation, but it's doing the work of telling your story from your own, you know, from your own core um, and telling the world the way you actually experiencing it, experience it, rather than speaking back to, you know, what the expectations of the world out there are. So that little piece of advice, it, just, it helped me so much. Um, and I, I think that, you know, in order to do this work properly and well, out of respect, both for oneself and for one's readers, it's really important to show ourselves in our greatest complexity with all the contradictions, right? And as 
insofar as possible with all the uglies hanging out. Mm -hmm. um, because complexity and, and contradiction, those are the things that, that make us human. And without them, we don't get to have mm -hmm. our humanity. But it's hard to do that, you know, when the pressure on representation, um, and you'll hear the activists calling for this a lot. It's like, well, you know, for all of these years, we've been portrayed as, you know, in really racist ways as villains or as minor characters or as, you know, um, fools or advisors or whatever we don't, you know? And so now we need to make positive representations. I'm like, mm -hmm. yes, but we need to be really careful that the positive representation doesn't itself become the production of new kinds of stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So that's how I think, I mean, that's how I think about it. And um, yeah, it seems to sort of help in terms of getting the fullness of character on the page. But what you're asking two questions here. So the other question you ask is, you know, when do you let the characters speak in their own voice? So I think that that's always the first and most important thing to do, that you should as much as possible, you know, try to step, keep your ego out of it and try to be a vehicle for mm -hmm. um, your characters. Mm -hmm. I had another epiphany recently, thanks to <clears throat> writer Tom Cho. I don't know if you know him, talk to him. Lovely, lovely, smart, smart guy. Um, and he said, it was just on Twitter, like about six or seven months ago, he said, you know, sometimes the dictum show don't tell. He said he thinks of it as a kind of colonial dictum meant to shut down the sort of more complex political thought of mm -hmm. um, BIPOC, you know, queer and other marginalized folks. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been thinking about that a lot and I'm actually working on a historical novel now myself, Danny, where, um, I've been sort of thinking about what Tom was saying and realizing that I have indeed swallowed that dictum show don't tell kind of hook, line and sinker. And by letting it go, I'm sometimes able, you know, by again, by using the full range of techniques that's available. So for sure, use the first person when you can, but mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with second and third. And when you need to sort of make an observation you know, about your character from the outside because it's something they couldn't possibly know or they could only know mm -hmm. in hindsight or it's what somebody else thinks or it's just what I think. Um, I think it's okay to do that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've been using it as a second, as a second resort, but not a last resort. Um, mm -hmm. And giving myself permission to do it a little bit more liberally. And what I'm finding is my characters are coming across with more complexity. They seem more mature and more round. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where before I was kind of like, must not, must not ever, ever, ever do that. Must always let them speak for themselves and never intervene. Mm -hmm. and well, that's I, the thing. Sorry, go, go. No, please. <laughs> well, that's the thing about representation, to be honest. Like, because sometimes when I look at my work, I do want to write about the Syrian refugee queer person experience. I, I find myself in that word and I, I want to write about it. And I, I'm, I, genuinely want to tell that story but at the same time sometimes I feel like representation is intended to be an answer to a question that I'm not the one who asked if that makes sense it's no. a question that white folks asked being mm -hmm. like what about the story of the brown person what about the story about the queer person and then me writing the representation is the answer to it while in reality what I'm trying to tell is a full-on story that is not meant to answer somebody else's questions, if no. that makes sense. That absolutely, that makes sense. That absolutely, absolutely makes sense. Because I mean, you're already a queer Syrian refugee, right? Mm. So why do you have to do anything to prove that? Like that's already mm -hmm. at least a large part of who you are. It's not mm -hmm. the sum total of who you are though, but it's part of who you are. So you're mm. always writing from that place, really regardless, even if you're just writing about, I don't know, a potato or a battery or whatever, right? You're writing from that place. And mm -hmm. so why should you need to make a thing of it? And I think that's the thing, right? That there's this pressure on us on to answer for ourselves, but on somebody else's terms. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. So one of the other things that I have discovered recently, actually I haven't discovered, as with anything that I think I've discovered. <laughs> It was actually taught to me by somebody else. So in this case, my good friend, Monica King-Gagnon, back in the day, in the early 90s, 
um, writing out of um, uh, an uh, anti-racism arts conference here in Calgary. I didn't live here yet. Um, and trying to work past an impasse between BIPOC folks and white folks. Mm -hmm. Suddenly realized she didn't need to talk to white people. Mm -hmm. Started writing letters instead to the artist Jamili Hassan. Um, and it was a completely different. So they were actual letters, but for public, they were public letters, but addressed mm -hmm. from, you know, to Jamili Hassan. Mm -hmm. And um, the kind of language, the stories, the problems that we were all facing suddenly came out in a completely different way because she'd imagined her audience differently. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this, the hard part about that is it doesn't sell because the market is still imagined, you know, in a very kind of Eurocentric way. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in terms of, I don't know, this new project, this poetry project that I have coming out is a series of letters kind of thinking about Monica's work. Um, so it's a series of letters to different entities and each entity gets a different letter and the world mm -hmm. unfolds differently because it's because I'm speaking right to somebody, mm -hmm. somebody, mm -hmm. I think that's going to be the way that we get out of this impasse, because otherwise we're endlessly going to be explaining ourselves in these racist terms that will never free us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, God, I, I want to continue having this conversation with you forever, but we have eight more minutes and I promise people a second reading from you. So I, I, I have a lot of people before we jump to the second reading, I have a lot of people saying, um, uh, Jenny, uh, she says, sometimes you are neither villain nor hero. Sometimes you are both. Uh, Serena says, uh, like the way that real talk and directness is vil uh, vilified. Uh, if everything has to be a metaphor. Uh, folks are just um, coming out, be engaging in the conversation. I am really appreciating everybody's engagement. So thank you so much, folks. But we only have like seven minutes left and I would love to hear from Larissa reading one more time. So I'm going to leave it to you, Larissa, right now. And I'm going to send myself back to mute land. Bye. Thank you, Danny. I'll read from the second voice. So this is a chapter called The Starfish Groom. Uh, and it is my clone character, Kirilo Granzel, speaking. Even if she is our last doubler, I don't want Auntie Radix to have Peristrophe Halliana's eyes. Auntie Radix already took Peristrophe Halliana's liver a week ago and one of her kidneys four weeks before that. Auntie Radix says that it is the duty and nature of a starfish to give. I tell her it is the duty and nature of a doubler to know when to stop asking. Peristrophe Halliana and I have seen the new monsoons only 19 times each. We are barely old enough to do what we do. Auntie Radix has been drenched by the rains 48 times. It should be her job to sacrifice for us and not the other way round. It's a good thing that memory is not a part of the body that can be cut out, or no doubt she would ask for Peristrophe Halliana's memory too. I bite back my resentment. Radix Bupluri is our queen, not to mention the eldest of the 83 sisters who live at Grist Village and a direct descendant of Grandma Chen Ling. She is well past a healthy age for childbearing but she is also our last doubler. With our death rates, we Grist sisters go the way of the dodo, unless she keeps birthing puppies. Yes, from her midnight egg space and pop out her who, once plump and fresh, now floppy as an old sock. Still juicy to her young groom who loves her. For me, nothing about her is juicy. Everything is duty. That means grit and grin through every whim and tantrum. I sigh. I clean then sharpen my knives on my precious whetstone. Don't you know that diamonds are a girl's best friend? We made the whetstone ourselves, crushed so many engagement rings from skeletons of the time before, six glass towers full of nice ladies, sweet so sweet. 
Purdy, the scavenger aunties tell me. Purdy as cover girl, wonderful wonder broad, guess by George Marciano. Purdy and thin as skin and bones. They had time to work off the weight, time to rot, time to mummify. For every season, there is a reason. Off their skinny dead fingers, the scavenger aunties took their diamonds, crushed those doggies to a coarse salt and made me my whetstone. Now I smooth my blade, one, two, three. All that love from the time before rushes into my shiv. That's the way the cookie crumbles, I tell my beloved peristrophe Halliana as I work my knives. Once they are good and sharp, I wipe them down with mother moonshine. We make it ourselves in clawfoot tubs from the time before with potatoes cropped from our own fields. You know, Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? We pretty maids, we sister grist, some call us tub puppets, fuck moppets, matchstick monkeys. Who cares? We will outlive them all in beds of our own making. As I prepare my knives, I rant the chant the grannies gave me, the one that Grandma Chunling heard from the dirt so long ago. My mother double, glory bind groundsel, smoking medicinal marijuana in the old rosewood pipe she inherited from Grandma Chunling herself, chants with me to make sure I get the words right. She teaches me my genealogy, you know, like where we came from, what we're here for. You must hold these things, Kirilo, she tells me. We hold all that remains of the old world's knowledge in our raw brains. That means we need to be extra smart. She teaches me how to be a good groom to my beloved peristrophe Halliana, the last starfish among us, the last giver. It isn't easy, you know, to have and to hold, to kiss and to cut. Slit sluts, that's what they call us in Saltwater City. I'm not ignorant, I know what they say. It's why they expelled our grannies 80 years ago for having and holding, for slicing and stitching. What did they expect from us anyhow? That they could keep making us again and again and again and again, bust us from their greasy bottles like so many cheap jean genies? As if. Grandma Chunling invented the parthopop. You know, how we egg ourselves along. I mean, the long lizardy love of the Grist sisters. We split, we slit, we heal, we groom. Self-mutated beyond the know-how of the clone company Gemini that spawned us and the host scale and microchip factories that bought our grannies to work for them. But there are flaws in our limited DNA, the DNA of just one woman. We mutate for better and worse, for sickness and health, but more for sickness and worse. Only our starfish can save us by regrowing whatever grooms like me cut out of them. Grandma Chunling invented the kiss cut, the repair job, what do you say, the fix, the patch. The first starfish gave her liver, her kidneys, and at last her red hot heart to the first doubler. And so it was in the beginning. I chant loud as I can, push down the dread that roils in my belly. Our mother of milk and mildew, our mother of dirt, our mother of songs and sighing, our mother of elk. Blessed are the sheep and blessed are the roses. Blessed are the tigers, wind, bones, and onion flowers. We remember you and we remember rain. We remember mushrooms holding the globe in their mycorrhizal net. We remember dust, we remember meat, we remember fiber in its weave and fiber in its weft, the shifting and wobbling of the intentional earth. Should I stop there, Danny? Maybe that's good. Uh, it's up to you, it's your show, my love. If you, yes, sure, let's do that. I really am thankful. It's, uh, again, that, will, that chapter was so enthralling, so fantastic. I, I remember because that was my introduction to um, 
to the book, I heard you reading this the first time and I just fell in love with the book and then I read it and I fell in love with it even more. Um, I wonder if it's on, um, is it an audiobook yet or not yet? It I is, wish yeah. it is. It's out on yeah. audio, ECW did it. So yeah, oh, people really cool. did. Um, uh, yeah, it's a good you, one. Yeah. Are you the it, one who read it? Did you read it? Oh, no. no. Um, uh, it was done by, um, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm gonna just, um, no, it, there were, there were actors and it was directed, um, uh, really, really, be really, really beautifully. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm just, gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Names are getting away from me because I'm tired. Um, but it was, they did such a beautiful, they did a really extraordinary, really beautiful job of the, mm -hmm. um, of the of the audiobook. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question from earlier on settler colonization by Rui Liu, and I didn't mean to skip the question. I'm really sorry, um, but I just got a notification that um, the question was skipped. Uh, for anybody, if do you mind if I ask you the question, uh, Larissa, and then maybe we can have a conversation. And everybody, usually this is the end of our show. Usually this is the moment that you uh, leave, but I would like to stay and answer that question. Uh, so please stay with us for a bit. That would be fantastic. I'm just going to look and if, if the person who asked the question can copy it again and post it because I honestly didn't see it. So uh, let me look. I'm so sorry, folks. I'm just, here we go. I have a new message, maybe, here we go. Uh, I would love to hear Larissa talk more about how they endeavored to figure the aftermaths and ongoings of settler colonizations and the kind of dystopia slash utopia futures they construct in the Tiger flu and how settlers of color figure in that future. I feel like this is a huge question, but um, we can work together, you and I, on trying to answer it to the best of our ability. Sure, sure. So sorry, I'm just gonna look at it a little more closely. I would love to hear Larissa talk more about how they endeavored to figure the aftermath and ongoingness of settler colonialism. This um, person, um, Rui Liu, Liu Louis, um, is reading the book well. I am exactly thinking about those kinds of things. So the, the on, afterness and ongoings of settler colonialism, the kinds of dystopic utopic futures they construct in the tiger flu and how settlers of color figure in that future. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a giant question and without a little prep time, I'm not sure I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, definitely these are the things, you know, that were on my mind. I was sort of, I was trying to think about how it might be possible for the world to continue with at least many of the people still in it and with the history that we've actually inherited, remembered, not forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, what I was saying earlier about you know the necessity of um, the necessity of thinking about the characters as complex, of, about thinking about the world as complex. So in other words, I'm not writing a utopia, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is a slight utopian impulse in in the novel. So the initial initial impulse is, you know, what would happen if all the men died and a community of um, Asian women clones survived? What mm -hmm. would happen? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that. The, that impulse it doesn't, you know, it doesn't come purely from me. I'm kind of following up some of the conversations um, in the um, in the '60s and '70s, where feminist and lesbian spec fiction writers um, were thinking seriously about separatism and were imagining these kinds of futures. And so I wanted to sort of take up the work of folks like, you know, Joanna Russ, Marge Piercy, Ursula Le Guin, um, and others, and uh, reimagine it from. Um, a queer BIPOC, a queer BIPOC mm -hmm. space. Um, so that is so that is going on. Um, the ongoingness, yes, because there's still a large corporation in the novel that does much of the same crappy stuff that 
large corporations in our contemporary world do. And then in terms of settler colonialism, um, um, I'm not sure if, um, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, Rui Louis, but if you caught um, uh, that there's a place called the United Middle Kingdom. And so I am of course thinking about the rise of China, right? And the kind of new Chinese forms of imperialism and how they echo and repeat um, specifically British forms of uh, colonialism and, and imperialism. So it's all tangled up there in the name uh, United Middle Kingdom. It's both the Middle mm -hmm. Kingdom and the United Kingdom at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm trying to think about that. So I'm not, in other words, sort of getting rid of the forces um, because, because because everything has continuity. Mm -hmm. um, nothing ever dies, everything has continuity. And so I'm trying to think about what, what, are the, what are the possible ways that that kind of continuity might, might, might present itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, then, and I, 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 I appreciate, thank you so much for, for uh, providing your thoughts. And really, I appreciate you asking that question. Like, yes, it is a humongous question. And sometimes as authors, we find ourselves answering big, large questions on the drop of a pen. Um, when I'm writing as well, I think about how my writing is situationed in the fact of my my position as an uninvited guest on this land, my position as somebody who colonization has caused me to escape my home country, like Syria is in a civil war because a hundred years ago, they divided the Middle East, the British and the French divided the Middle East according to their own spoils of war situation. So I was pushed out because of colonization and then I came here and find myself unwittingly participating in colonization. So it is this, this balance between writing truthfully about uh, the experiences of queer refugees coming to Canada and finding a home for themselves here in Canada, but also not stepping on uh, cultural appropriation and taking on stories of indigenous folks. So it is, I think it's a, it's a, it's a balance that we as queer authors of color specifically because we're aware that our stories are being told, we are aware as well not to tell other people's stories, if that yeah. makes sense, or not yeah. to like jump into telling those other, or at least to tell them with as much respect, research and understanding as we can with, with that. So my answer to this is that I think looking at the, our position as uh, queer settler, sorry, as pe people of color settlers on indigenous lands is by itself complicated and requires a lot of fine tuning to the words that we say, I would say, to the words we put on a page. Yes, yeah, I would agree with you. Um, I think that, you know, that this whole question of cultural appropriation, it's, um, it's a really, really important one because indigenous people's stories have been taken, right? And they have been misrepresented and um, settler folk have made careers telling indigenous people's stories. So it's really, really important not to, not to steal those stories as um, Lenore Kishig says. Um, but then by the same token, I also think that it's really important. Like I don't want to live in a world where there's only other Asian people, you know? So when I'm writing my fiction, I also want other folks to be there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, put the mm -hmm. pressure on them to make representations, and I do do it in the Tiger Flu, to make representations of people who are not non-Asian people, because mm -hmm. I want Indigenous folks, I want Black folks, I want white folks too, to be there in mm -hmm. my world. I don't want my world to vanish. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question of how one makes that representation respectfully, you know, I'm more and more kind of coming to the conclusion that it's a matter of a certain, I call it a poetics after both Fred Waugh and uh, Joan Redlack, um, mm -hmm. because it's a way of thinking that kind of 
doesn't so much set rules. It doesn't set rules, but it asks us to feel with our ethics mm -hmm. in, in a more um, grounded kind of, at the risk of sounding flaky, at a, at a more in a more heart-centered kind of way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it also obviously opens the doors to mistakes and errors. And that's that whole thing, right? About people trying to wash their hands that I was talking about at the start. None of us gets mm -hmm. to have our hands clean. If we tell stories, our hands are not clean. Um, but there's still better and worse ways of telling them, I think. I agree. I agree. I put uh, Diane Roberts's name in the room, and as well as Lisa Chuang and Gracelyn Kang. I'm, I feel so embarrassed that I gapped on that um, because uh, Diane Roberts is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful theater director who directed, um, who directed the audiobook for the Tiger Flu. Mm -hmm. And um, Huang played uh, Cora and Grace Lin Kung played Kirilo and they did a fabulous job. It's very, very beautiful. Uh, awesome. So with it. Well, thank you so much for naming those folks, Clarissa. And thank you so much for spending the evening with me. I think um, I, I see a lot of uh, notes here from people who are telling us positive uh, feedback about the event, uh, folks who are very appreciative that you were there. I see people in the screens, in their little screens, Kit and Audrey Opry over there, just like uh, sharing their little claps. So thank you so much. I love seeing those little faces everywhere. So um, I really appreciate the time that you spent with me. I really appreciate the 21 people who showed up today. This is the biggest group that I had ever on I have been wondering. So, and that's a testament to how much people adore you, Larissa Lai. You adore uh, you, I try, I try. I mean, I'm really good looking, so that helps. <laughs> right, yes, um, you are. <laughs> uh, next month, next month, I have Jay, Jill Richardson with her book, Gutter Child. Jill Richardson with Gutter Child on March 4th. So please join us. Uh, the book is number four today after a week of being released in the best-selling books across Canada. It is a fantastic book. I'm also listening to the audiobook. That's why I asked about audiobooks because apparently it's a thing and I started listening to them and they're amazing. Um, so I'll see you folks next month. And uh, Larissa, you're the queen of everything and I appreciate you and I love you. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much for having me, Danny. It's been such a pleasure being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night. All right. Bye-bye.